Right, good morning everyone and welcome to the channel. We're back at Winglands. You may be able to hear in the background the model aircraft going on and there's some people watching me in the background. <laughs> Talking we did this intro to the vlog. So we've come to the, uh, the Viterazzi maintenance day that was run by uh, Skybound Aviation. I'll leave a link to their website in the, in the top or in the description. And uh, this is looking at maintenance on the Viterazzi Mosta and the Atom engine um, and going through some bits and pieces. So I'll leave some details about the course, um, but basically Clive who runs it, uh, it's, it's all about education um, and helping the end user at the end of the day understand their engine and get the best out of it. So I'm not going to do an interview with, uh, with Clive because he's not too keen on that side of it. But also what I will do is I'll give you a little bit of a flavour and then we'll do a bit of a wrap up. So it's been quite a short video today, but just give a, a, an understanding of what the uh, the Mostar engine is all about. Uh, this will be for the paramotorist and also the uh, those that have a, um, a sub 70 that has a Mostar on the back end of it uh, just to give you a flavour of, of what we need to do when we look after our engines. Okay so hopefully enjoy the rest of the video. you stretch it and have a look so you need to stand on the frame yeah and you need to pull it and you need to inspect the rubbers and that's what I'm looking for yeah same with the exhaust yeah I'm putting pressure on things because if there is a crack a hidden crack or it was waiting to break I want it to break now because if it broke now it meant there was a problem that was just hidden that hidden problem will finally present itself. If you don't look for it, it will then tell you when it's ready to let you know it's broke, yeah? Which is when typically you're using it, yeah? Same with springs, yeah? People don't, yeah? They're, they're all protected, just grab hold of them and move the springs. So you've got your airbox rubber. Um, the airbox rubber is, is a little bit easier to see on, on this engine and on, on the Atom. But what you need to be doing is actually moving things, yeah? These rubbers split in, um, in the middle. Carbs that an awful lot of um, uh, engine, engines use. Because of the attitude changes, the float bowls, they need to work under gravity and they need to float. Um, and if they're getting turned upside down, they don't float, they're being drowned. Um, and, and then it messes up the carburetor. So our carburetors are not float bowls, they're, they're, they're referred to as diaphragm carburetors. There is a kind of fuel chamber which sits in, sits in here, but it's what's classed as a momentary fuel chamber. There's just enough fuel in there at any given time to allow the engine to work. At the carburetor we've got a big hole, and that's called the Venturi. That's where the air gets uh, sucked through via the piston. And that is gated by a, a brass circle, yeah, which is affectionately known as the butterfly. So it's the same with this. This, all that happens is we've got low pressure, we've got static pressure, fuel gets sucked into that area. It creates, it creates a suction there, moves 
moves the lever arm, opens the fuel, fuel comes in to replace it. It's happening every, every time there's a stroke, isn't it? Yeah. Because you're creating that vacuum every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the process. Right. So, what's critical about this is that there's a lot of things. We can regulate how much fuel gets in there because those screws are conical. And I've tried to draw this, so that when you screw it in, the conical starts to close off the labyrinth of fuel that's going there. So we restrict the fuel by the taper that's getting pushed further into the chamber. It doesn't quite work, look like that, but that's the only way I can draw it in two dimensional. So we, we, can, we can manipulate two, ends, two, end, two operating ends of the, of the engine um, with, with these jets. So we can restrict how much fuel goes in there by these. But what we can also have a problem with is that if this needle valve is allowed to stay open longer than it's needed, the pump will just say happy days and it will pump fuel past, pump fuel into here, regardless if there's a low pressure calling for it or not, the pump will just go, okay, I'm going in there and I'm just gonna push it back round. That's when we refer to pop-off pressures. If your pop-off pressure is wrong, if, it, if the pop-off pressure is too high, it means it needs a lot more force. Um, not, well, not force, it, it means that the valve will shut quicker, which changes the timing of the valve. If the, if the pop-off pressure is too low, it means that the valve will stay open longer, which means there's more fuel able to be pumped in before it finally shuts off. If more fuel comes in, it will just go, I've come in here, I've got nowhere to go, and I'm still getting the pump because the valve's still open. It will just pump up the channel, push it into the engine. The engine will say, yeah, I'll have that all day long, and it will just, and it will just crudely burn it for you, and that's why you then have a higher fuel burn because you've got too much fuel that's getting pumped through. So the pop-off pressure in this spring is regulating the timing of how quick this shuts and closes. And that's then regulating how much fuel's in there. There should be just enough fuel for this to be able to suck the fuel out by, by its call, call of sucking, rather than it being artificially pushed through because there was a delay um, or, or, or a speed up of the opening and closing of this valve. Yeah. So this valve's quite important. I, I said at the beginning is that if the pop-off and, and the meter inside of this is not right, it doesn't matter how much twiddling you do here, you will get under fueling or over fueling. Um, and you will try and adjust it here, but these two, these two screws work in harmony. And if you've got a gross problem here, you'll do a gross adjustment maybe on the low, and then when it moves into the high jet circuit of operating on the carburetor, the low is not working in tandem properly now because it was, it was grossly adjusted for uh, compensating because this was in the wrong area. So this carburetor is a, um, and you, you sort of need to know this, but it's in the manual. Vitter actually kindly grind off the, the numbers. That's not because they're being secretive, yeah? They're trying, they're trying to get you to buy their carburetor. And there's a reason for that is because even though that is a, that was a stock Japanese carburetor, it gets modified by Vitarazzi. Yeah, so Vitarazzi do quite a little bit of retouching to the carburetor. Um, and there's a whole reason, I'll, I'll touch light on it, is because mid-range is the only bit that you can't really physically tune on the carburetor because the mid-range is a combination of both of these and that's why I said they work in tandem. And you can't get the mid-range sort of right if the pop-off and meter lever height is not right because you will never stand a chance of getting it to run well. Because yeah? mm -hmm. they're trying to improve the mid-range to match the engine. Yeah, mm -hmm. Because a stock carburetor, you can bolt to any engine, but every engine's got its own requirements on fuel delivery at mid-range. Yeah? So this tool gets a little bit more complicated because it's got loads of numbers and um, stuff on there, but it's related to the whole range because it's a multi-tool. It's, um, it's conveniently in the shape of the W as well, which is quite quirky for Walbro. Um, so this is a WG, sorry, a WB carburetor. A WG is the early atoms. That is the nobule that we're going to be using. So what we do, 
and normally light's quite good for this, is that you're going to be placing the main part of the tool on the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I start behind the, the, the rocker because if it's too high I don't want to use my brute force and then fold it up. So what we're checking is, is the height of the needle. And what I should be able to do is brush brush that over the tip of the of the seesaw of the lever arm and it should be just glancing it. But, 12. Yeah, it depend, depends which, which which engine which engine it is. But let me just first of all show you what the pop-off is and then we'll show you how, how to adjust it. The value at the moment is not the important thing because the value is going to be different for everyone's engines, yeah? Depending on what engine you're flying. We're just going to show you how the pop-off works. Make sure that's free to see. That's just for your um, protection, unless you really a maverick. Right. Okay, so that popped a little bit higher than the regular settings that we were getting because I'm not over aggressive in stretching because I'd rather stretch it a couple of times than, than over stretch it, yeah. yeah? So that's how I would manipulate it that way. Right, I'm just gonna show you how I do the spring the other way. Watch some online videos, they're saying, I was gonna do American accent then, but I will. Um, they're saying, if the pop-off's a little bit high, you need to weaken the spring. Oh, they don't okay. weaken it, they shorten it, yeah? yeah? And they shorten it by trimming with a pair of nail clippers yeah. and they just nip a bit off and nip a bit off, yeah? Right, the thing with the spring is, and you need to look at it, yeah, and my eyes are not brilliant. Anyway, the final sort of three windings are as such, so that it gives the spring a um, perpendicular base to the spring. Yeah. You start trimming it, the, crank, the spring doesn't want to sit straight, it wants to sit at a, a yeah. cap. So when it starts working, it buckles rather than just working. Yeah? Never trim the spring. Yeah? So, you can change the characteristics of the spring by just being very gentle with it. Yeah? If I want to increase the pressure, this is where you've got to be careful, and this is where it pays to have an extra spring to hand <laughs> when attempt number one fails. Yeah? It's, it's not possible to get different pressure springs. It is, yeah, but you, you, you would, um, the, the, there is absolutely no need, yeah? So when I'm in the plate in a spring, that is much as I'm doing, okay. yeah? I'm just giving it a little tease, yeah? Some people go, all right, I need to pull it, and then next thing, it's two inches long. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's buggered, yeah? So I just give it a little bit of a tease, yeah? yeah. Right on the end, we should start seeing some magic. Now, that's not the end of the story. Right, so the end of the story is now, when I start turning this bell, what you'll see is you'll the grooves will start to nest in and theoretically the bow is getting longer so that the bar should drop yeah so this is not the end of the process what you do now is you turn the bow what's happening to the arm yeah, dropping, it's because it's seating and it's and it's able to get theoretically longer yeah so what I normally do I want that bar horizontal all the time so what I do, I don't get technical, I just lean the machine over till it gets technical because I want I want that weight perpendicular yeah, to uh, to the thing, yeah. So I've turned that a few times, yeah. I am totally happy with that, yeah. I take out my screwdriver. Right, before I get so I do this a little bit at a time. Just gently knit that, and I gently knit that because before I start tightening this, I just want to make sure that that is fully back. In true terms, it takes it takes about a day. But no, no, it it takes a it takes about a day and a bit. Um, 
Hi everyone, it's halfway through the video, so don't run away just yet. This isn't the outro. This is Dominic. Dominic and I know each other from <laughs> old, don't we? Yeah, so, we do. Uh, we're not going to say where we know each other from, but that's, that's another story. Um, so hopefully that's given you a bit of a flavour of what's going on with, uh, and I actually want to point out, it's Dominic's air, uh, machine, isn't it? Yeah, you, it is. You've yeah. found some interesting things with your machine, haven't you? Yeah, we did. It's been running a bit hot by the looks of this. So inside, that's all the oil that's baked inside. And let's see the top of it. And if we look along it, it's... Um, it's been domed, so yeah. your, your machine's been pretty much cooked, isn't it? It has, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah the piston swelled up and got a bit bigger, so we've had to change the piston out. Yeah. Uh, bit of wear and tear on the cylinder head, so we've got, got a little bit more life out of the cylinder head now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Have you been learning lots from the course today? Yeah, definitely. I, I literally thought I was going to turn up and maybe change a gasket, and then it would all be fine. Because yeah. the motor was running like when I brought it here, yeah. so I didn't realise any of this was actually there until we popped the lid off her and yeah. had a look inside. And uh, it's it's completely changed your outlook on uh, on micro sorry not micro light on uh, paramotor maintenance. Yeah, definitely. Like I would definitely start doing a bit more maintenance now. <laughs> <laughs> and invest in, the, in a torque wrench. Invest in a torque <laughs> wrench and, and do a bit more, a few more checks before and after flight. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So we're going to jump back to the video, so don't worry, there's going to be more maintenance bits and pieces all the way through to doing squish on the cylinder head as we put Dominic's machine back together again, and we'll join you at the end of the video. Um absolutely minimal tools so we've taken the head off yeah uh -huh. um, so before I go and take the head off I found out that we had a problem how did I know we had a problem with the head nuts oh loose there was a weep there was a stain well there's a stain but what did I put on the head nuts first Some I talked them down talk. first yep. do not just go and undo your head nuts yeah ah. tell yourself a story yeah so if you just crank them off did you know they were loose? Yeah, right, no. Yeah. So before you take them off, check the torque. Yeah. yeah. If the torque was fine, you can say, well done. I didn't mess up there. Yeah. yeah. Then undo them. Yeah. Undo them and take them off. Don't lose an opportunity to because if they had if they were loose, then you can say to yourself, shit, I need to check that a bit more. And then you make a mental note. Yeah. yeah. But if they were tight, you can say, happy days, they haven't moved since the last time I've done them, which however you record that. They're in there, yeah. So, um, now you've done a decoke, yeah. Yep. Right. Okay. So this engine is telling me a story. Yeah. yeah? Um, oh, yeah. that's a good one. No, no. It's, <laughs> it, at some point, it's had a bit of heat go through it. Yep. Yeah. And how do you think I know that? Tarnishing. Oh, you you can see a pit part. in the top of this piston. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. There's a pit. It's a bit Right, oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's flat, it's flattish and possibly slightly concaved. Yeah. yeah. So the piston's meant to be domed. When it gets quite hot, not hot enough where it starts mm -hmm. doing, Slightly. starts doing all this sort of thing and, and melting it. Yeah. yeah. It's got hot where it's got pliable. Yeah. Then the compression stroke is like a punch from Tyson. Wow. Yeah. And that compression stroke then will reform by air pressure, it will push the piston down. Yeah. And the piston won't move. If you measure it this way, because there is slight play in the piston, uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. piston will theoretically rock, rock not that much, yeah. but then you'll get an in inaccurate yeah. reading. So we want a reading that is directly mm -hmm. in line yeah. with the gudgeon pin, right? So. What I'm going to need to do, so the gudgeon pin's in line with the fins, yeah, this is pretty much in line. You don't have to be too accurate because the reason being is, is you're going to, you're going to pull this over a few times. If this hits, let's say I put it in this way, it will not pound this down. The only time it will get the lowest pound in is when it's directly above the gudgeon pin. So what I do is when this goes into the hole, yeah. When I'm pulling this over, I just rotate it through that angle, and at some point, it's going to clobber it exactly on top of it. Yeah, yeah. and when it does, that will be its lowest reading because that's all I'm interested in is its mm. its squishish squishish reading. Yeah, but until I know what I got, I can't take an educated guess now. Right. So when you measure this, because I've just said that squish band doesn't run parallel, it's it's the best at the end. We have to measure right on the end. And that's reading 1.74. Okay. 
So welcome back. This is pretty much wrapping up the video. Don't run away just yet, but I say, Dom, would you recommend anyone trying to get on a course like this? I would definitely recommend it um, to all levels, basically. Like, even if you're not going to do the maintenance yourself, at least you know what's going into it as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and what to look for before it goes wrong. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, um, obviously, once it goes wrong, it's costly. So if you can notice it beforehand, you can save yourself some money. Yeah. Clive was telling us about some seriously big bills from little indications that we've learned about today from the engine that are telling you the engine's always talking to you and uh, there were some quite destructive pistons in there weren't they yeah, i've shown those on the screen either now <laughs> or earlier in the video how these engines were apparently running fine and then just destroyed themselves in minutes with really big expensive bills attached to them where they could have landed or or prevented the maintenance so uh, thank you very much for participating Thanks in this so interview. Much. This pretty much wraps up the uh, the video for this for this time. So until next time, everybody, fly safe. <laughs>